Hello and welcome to this video. Today I want to take a look at the Swift 5 release notes for Xcode 10.2 beta. Apple just released the release notes and I want to take a look at them because Xcode 10.2 is gonna come with Swift 5, the new version of Swift that we're all waiting for. And this is not gonna be a deep dive kind of video on the new features of Swift 5. This is just gonna be going through the release notes, but I just want to take a look at the stuff that they introduce, see if I see anything interesting that I can share with you. So let's go right in. The first thing we see is huge news. In new versions of the operative systems, like we see here, the, the Swift runtime and the dynamic libraries are not gonna be included on each binary, on each application that you download from the store. And that's because these new versions of the operating system already will include the, the runtime necessary for Swift to work in your apps. But the interesting thing is that your apps, when you deploy them and when you upload them to the store, they will still include the runtime there and all the Swift binaries that you, that you are using when you compiled the app. The nice thing is that the app thinning feature of the App Store is gonna know that these, these new versions already include these specific versions of the runtime and they are gonna remove it from the package that the user downloads. So the packages that the user will download and the size that it will take on the user's device is gonna be much lower. I've seen on Twitter already people claiming that, well, the change is from 224 kilobytes, you know, like instead of two and almost a half megabytes. That's huge wins because if you need, if you think that this is gonna happen for every application that you have installed on your phone, on, on your device, this is a huge win. In terms of language features, the first one, the big one that we see on Swift 5, although it's one of these ones that is not for everybody, is the dynamic callable. This is the second part of two proposals that were done a while ago by Chris Latiner. The first one of which was dynamic member lookup that we already had on Swift 4.2, I think. Uh, you have the video available on my channel to look and to know a lot more about it. This is the second part which makes any type be able to be called, so you can use the two parentheses and treat it like if it was a function. This is really interesting because it allows us to make types that behave like functions and these in some specific cases can be really powerful. The new one is key paths that support the identity path, so like you can do you can use the that self key path like we have in this example and it refers to the element itself so you can access an integer with the key path self and it basically is gonna return the integer itself. In this case obviously it's not really useful but you need to think that when you're writing code based on key path and you make it generic in this way it's super powerful that now an API that you use with key paths the user of that API can use the self uh, the identity key path in this case they call it to refer to the object, the entire object itself. This is powerful and I'm pretty sure that people that use this kind of lenses from functional programming is gonna be super happy to have this. Here we have like a some weird behavior with uh, enums that no longer can accept uh, variadic arguments. I have, I don't think I've ever used variadic arguments in an enum, but yeah, that's something that has changed now. This one is one of the, you know how is Swift evolution. So now and then you have one of these proposals that gets everybody triggered and this one was one of them. I'm not sure I fully agree with the reasoning of the change, but I guess, well, tough life, no? This is basically making the try question mark behave kind of some other events of the language, which that's that's good news. I think I already talked with about this on a video. But it basically, if the try question mark is executed in a method that already returns an optional, the try question mark is gonna flatten the double nested optional that will result from it. So you just have a single level optional, which is nice, I guess, but it may be weird if what you actually wanted was that behavior. So be careful with it. Now, this one is an interesting one because you really don't gonna see it unless you are working with, for example, the example they have here, which is about big integers. The way the Swift works in kind of simple words is that when you use the literal, the compiler has kind of a default way of transforming that literal that is in your code 
into something that can be treated at runtime or even compiled in the binary. There was a situation here where it didn't quite work as expected because, for example, in this case, by default, the compiler before was treating this and trying to convert it to, do, to this default interpretation of it, which is like an integer, which cannot fit this huge number. Even if you made an integer 64 that was supporting this number internally, the fact that the compiler was converting before your code had a chance to deal with it into a representation that was not compatible, it meant that this didn't work at all. Now the compiler, it's understanding that your code can deal with it, so it's just gonna give literally the same thing that it's on your source code to you and you have to deal with it without behaving with this intermediate step that, that it was not ideal for these cases. Anyway, it's kind of like a specific thing that people that write libraries or new types that benefit from these literal expressions are going to be really thankful for. The string interpolation API has improved a lot. Like they mentioned performance, clarity, efficiency, but it's really, really good. I really like what they are working on and I'm, I'm pretty sure that we're going to see an improvement in libraries that provide a lot of type safety with strings, basically. I wrote about it in my blog post about domain-driven development a while ago. And I'm super happy that Swift is making these improvements to make things like this nicer. Some new features for the standard library is this renaming from dictionary literal to key value pairs. I know this, it's been, I don't know, been talked for ages and I'm happy that finally we have come to an agreement. The issue with dictionary literal was that it didn't transmit exactly what was going on because you actually just have a set of key value pairs but it didn't have to be a dictionary per se, it could be another thing. So now that this is running into key value pairs, it most represents what you have, which is a list of key value pairs, which I think it keeps the order and stuff like that, which for example, the dictionary doesn't have. So that's why the, that name was kind of confusing. Here we have some bridging with Objective-C and strings that I'm not sure it's gonna affect many people, but be aware of it. So be careful and read it properly. And here we have one of these other ones that it's causing so much trouble on the community. There have been conversations about this for ages. What is a sequence? What is a collection? If this split, if this categorization makes sense or not, or we should have other ways of categorizing this? Because technically one of them is like you can only iterate through, through the sequence once, but then collection you can do it more than once. And like there has been a huge... Uh, discussions about it, which are really nice because it, it goes deep into the meaning of these types and what they mean and, and how you realize the potential of them. Finally, we have come to the conclusion that a subsequence associated type doesn't make any sense on the sequence, so it has been removed from there and instead now you still have it on the collections. So the majority of code that was extending collections and using this subsequence associated type is going to still work. And the ones that were doing it with sequence, you will have to change and return a specific type instead. And here is another one about strings. And in the effort of Swift of making better to use strings with a language, we know that Swift is one of the most complete languages in terms of a string. And the way it deals with Unicode is one of the best ones in terms of correctness. But sometimes it's been tricky. Sometimes it's, uh, the, the performance of it it's not been ideal. So in Swift fact, they have put a lot of effort on it which thinks that it's going to turn out to be a proper change on the language now that it's available on the Vito. The Swift Package Manager has many new things, which are super cool because it shows that the Package Manager is, is continuing to evolve and soon we are going to all able to use it properly on all our projects. Uh, the first thing is that now you can define some target-specific builds that we are used to define, for example, on Xcode. There are ways to do it, but now it seems like it's much better. One of the things we were using that before I remember is because you wanted to set the minimum deployment target for Apple platforms, obviously, because if you don't do that and then you import that code with an Xcode project, for example, then Xcode starts complaining that, well, you are not, you cannot use this code because it's not supported on, the, on all the versions that your code technically supports, even if you know, no, no, my code is only supporting the most recent one. So now we can specify that on the package that's with. This dependency mirroring feature, it's super cool because especially when you start using third-party libraries, but you start forking them and stuff like that, 
you want to be able to say no like for this package please don't use this official one just use the version i'm providing the swift test command now generates code coverage data in a standard format i guess it's the same format that xcode can support and yeah you see like code coverage which it's really useful to know exactly the coverage of your of your code it's nice that we can do it now with the swift package manager it no longer supports the old version of the of the package that swift which i guess is nice i mean like we have been supporting it for a while now so i guess swift 5 finally is the moment to start cleaning up this old stuff we also have some performance improvements and some new settings that we can pass to tweak a little bit the behavior of it and this one is super cool i've never used it i'm not used to use the REPL in the command line i prefer to use the playgrounds and xcode but i guess this is super cool for people that works mainly on linux and now the swift run command can accept this REPL option that allows you to to start the REPL, but also importing packages that you have defined so you're gonna start playing with the dependencies and playing with the APIs directly from a REPL without having to create a new project. Other things the compiler he's introducing is the exclusive memory access is now enforced at runtime by default. They introduce it on Swift 4 or something and now it's enforced by default, which is nice because it means that we are gonna be the Swift code is gonna be safer in the future. They are making big steps to this future where we can have like ownership and semantics on the language, which is a super interesting topic. Swift 3 mode has been removed. I mean, again, like in the same vein as the package manager removal. It makes sense. We have been supporting it already during the entire Swift 4 timeline. So I think it's fine. It's a good approach that they gave us an entire version of time to migrate. This one is one of these changes that cause a lot of trouble in the community on Swift Evolution because it changes something that we have presumed it was fine until now and it's the enums being exhaustive or not basically. And right now with these changes in Swift 5 mode as it says here the enums coming from Objective-C unless stated otherwise they are going to be treated as open enums which means that we need to be careful of receiving cases that are not specified in our version of the library. This can happen if new cases are added after updates on libraries that are installed on the predictive system or dynamic libraries that are loaded in runtime. This is not a huge deal for the majority of app developers and stuff like that but it's important that if we want a language that is correct that we start thinking about these cases and generally, if you could have control over the code, you can just set this close enum and that's it. And the compiler will know, well, this is not going to change, so I can do the checks exhaustively and we don't lose any of the nice features that we love from Swift enums. This one is huge, like huge. I cannot tell you how many times I hate that when you are looking into the into the generated interfaces you only see default it is like yes i know but what's the default if i'm initializing something and and is accepting a parameter with an enum which is pretty common to accept different modes or something like that i want to know which is the default mode and it's like oh yeah it's the default but tell me which one now apparently this is gonna be super nice this last one i'm not pretty sure about it i haven't followed this discussion to be honest but I can see how an owned, which is like an implicit DMRAP optional, could have some issues with optional types. So that one is interesting. We should look at it. I'm going to skip over the known issues because probably many of them are going to be solved on the new beta. And we are not here for that. But the resolve issues, let's take a quick look. We have some extension improvements that they were causing issues before in some specific cases. This one, yeah, I've seen this one. They actually fix an issue that it's a specific case, but if you think that this this function at the root class is saying I want to return self, which means I'm gonna return a type of the class on which one I'm being calling at, and then you derive and you say, well, you know what? I'm not gonna return self. I'm actually gonna re return one specific type, which which is me. You think that's fine because it actually at this stage, this is fine. You are returning the ref, which it inherits from base and itself because you are calling it at this level. That's fine. This is, this is not final, which means that somebody can 
inherit again from derive, so have like a double derive, and if then you don't overwrite, it means that when somebody is using this double derive and calling this factory method, the object that is going to come out is going to be typed as derived instead of the double derived. Uh, it's weird, I know, but it's it's a case that can happen, it can cause many issues because the compiler was not dealing with it correctly, and now it is. This one is really, I mean, yes, I mean, I've never found it, but I can see how this is an issue, that you declare a type here, and you declare a variable with the same type, and allow hell is open, so I'm glad they fixed this. And here we have some more improvements. Uh, this one is kind of weird, I mean, I guess it makes sense, but it's just, this is a closure, and this guy accepts technically a closure, which I'm not exactly sure why I cannot pass this directly, I don't see it at the first glance, but the behavior is the same because when you, even if you pass this closure calling it, it's gonna be wrapped automatically into an auto closure from this guy. So the behavior is the same, I find it just weird that you cannot just do this, to be honest. Yeah, when casting an optional to a placeholder, okay, that's nice, yeah. I think that's it for today. We have taken a look at the release notes for 3.5 that it's coming on XCOM 10.2. I think that's all. The team has been working hard on this, so we should all be thankful for it. And the people in the community that has been contributing also. So thank you for watching and see you next time.